Okay. Uh, I'm Alex Oguso from Kenya Revenue Authority. I want to present to you the, uh, my research area, which is on sustaining fiscal consolidation effort in Kenya and South Africa. And I know the first, questions that com the first question that comes to your mind is why, why Kenya and South Africa? Uh, initially, I was focusing on Kenya, but I felt that it's better that uh, I do like uh, a comparison with the South Africa because South Africa is, uh, I believe, the best performing country in Sub-Saharan Africa in terms of domestic revenue mobilization. And it will be interesting to know, to see how, how they handle their fiscal consolidation efforts as compared to Kenya, so, uh, so we can learn from them as well. So what is fiscal consolidation? This is simply the government policies and measures that uh, the government undertakes to reduce the budget deficits and also to reduce the accumulation of debt. So when we talk of sustainability of this, of fiscal uh, consolidation, uh, Adam and Bevan defines this using three approaches, the level approach, gradient approach, and the composite approach. So the level approach is uh, where we have a threshold of, of which when the budget deficit is above that threshold, then we say that the consolidation effort has failed. The gradient approach is where you look at the current budget deficit uh, in relation to last year's budget deficit. If there is a reduction, a, a continuous reduction, then we are saying that the, the budget, the, the fiscal consolidation process is uh, in progress. If the budget deficit for this year is higher than the one for last year, then we say that the consolidation effort has failed. So we need to, 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 to undertake more measures to ac uh, accomplish that. Then there is the composite approach that uh, is a combination of, of the two. <coughs> so the background of this study is on uh, the public debt dynamics in Kenya. As you may be aware, in the 1980s, uh, our debt was widely unsustainable. Uh, debt for the sub-Saharan African region was widely unsustainable. And in the late 1990s, there were conversion of debts into grants. There was this program for highly indebted poor countries and multilateral debt relief initiative. So there, were, there was a lot of debt relief during that period in the, in the early 2000s, late 1990s and early 2000s. And this, from this, the median public debt to GDP ratio for, for, for the sub-Saharan region reduced from 85.3% to in, 20, in 2001 to 34.3% in 2011. So, so the, it, it, uh, from, from the debt dynamics, we see that post-2011 there has been a, a reaccumulation of debt and it seems that this debt relief just gave us enough fiscal space to accumulate more debt. So even, even in our current situation, it seems that uh, this might not be a, sol uh, a solution that uh, maybe the, 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 the creditors might uh, pursue. So we need to look at how we can internally handle the, the debt accumulation uh, problem. So the, the study by Ndulu and uh, O'Connell in 2021 also noted that there is a change in profile of the debt that we are holding. We are holding more of Chinese debt, which is less concessionary. By that I mean that they, they have more commercial terms or they are not, uh, some of them are even attached to, to assets like uh, ports. So th they are not, uh, they are less conces concessionary as compared to, to the, the Paris Club debt that we were holding uh, before. So what is the problem here? We have a, a potential or a looming debt crisis in South Africa if we don't take action and uh, this it's uh, evidenced by the recent trend in uh, our reaccumulation of debt. And as noted by Ndungu uh, et al., uh, the, the, uh, the median public debt to GDP ratio has risen, has risen to, for the region has risen to about 58% in, uh, by 2019. Uh, you are aware of the COVID, COVID that COVID happened in 2020 in uh, 20 and this has worsened the position because what we we experienced is that uh, there were disruption in economic activities and then uh, it meant that there were disruption in the tax base and so the revenue collections were, were 
were interfered with, were, uh, were lower, were, and were compromised. While on the other hand, we had an increased pressure for the government to increase spending because we also had uh, uh, the government putting in more funds in social welfare programs to cushion the, 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 the citizens from the effect of COVID. And so this has, there has been an increased public expenditure pressure, which has worsened uh, our physical position. So, so uh, with this, <coughs> the countries have been trying to, to consolidate their physical position. And as you can see from that, uh, the two graphs, the graph on top shows the overall budget uh, deficit uh, adjustment for Kenya for the period 1990 to 2000 uh, to 2020. So as you can see from that graph, we see that the adjustments have been inconsistent, but it, they were more erratic before the year 2000. And despite those efforts, we can see that uh, the debt to GDP ratio has been, has been steadily rising from 2008 to 2020. So one thing we also noted that uh, uh, the, the relatively longer fiscal uh, consolidation efforts registered uh, were registered in the period 1993 to 1997 and 2002 to 2007. And this seemed to have come after, after a general election. In 1993, we had uh, a change in, uh, 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 we had a general election whereby we moved from single party system to a multi, multi party system. In 2002, we had a change in the regime whereby we, uh, Honorable Mike Kibaki came in under the NAC uh, government, uh, which ended the 24 year rule of our second president. And so, and so there is an indication that political economy factors come into play when we are looking at. Uh, issues to do with sustainability of, of fiscal consolidation. When we compare to South Africa, we can we have the two graphs there. For the first one is on fiscal adjustment, and you can see that uh, uh, focusing on the last decade, you can see there's, uh, there was a, a steady uh, consolidation, but this seemed to have failed in 2017 and uh, 2018, before COVID, so we can't blame COVID for it there could be other underlying issues. So it will be interesting to, to see what, what led to, to that failure. It will also be interesting to see why they were able to sustain their fiscal consolidation effort from 20, well, 2009 to around 2017. But if you compare it with the Kenyan one, the Kenyan one seems to have, it's like a stationary. It's like we are not making effort, but at least for them they had achieved some uh, they had uh, they had made some uh, they had sustained it for almost ten years, so so we that's why we will want to compare the two. However, both have continued to to accumulate their debt. So, there is, what is the research problem here? So the research problem here is that uh, uh, we have an increasing debt uh, debt burden for the two countries, as you can see by the statistics there, from thirty eight point four percent in zero seven. 62% uh, of GDP in 2019, that is for Kenya, and for South Africa from 26.5 to 62.2% in 2019. And then we have, uh, so this, this one thing to note is that the current reaccumulation of debt has, been, has also been accompanied by slowdown in economic growth and stagnant growth in uh, uh, domestic revenue which has even been impacted negatively by the COVID crisis. So, so, so as, as these countries transition through and out of the COVID crisis, it is important that uh, they ensure fiscal sustainability. However, we can see the countries are still accumulating debt and therefore uh, it is important to, to, to have, uh, to, to take measures that will ensure that they sustainably consolidate their fiscal position, position. So that's why we wanted to, to look at uh, what are these factors that can lead to this, uh, a successful fiscal consolidation in, in the two countries. So what are the research questions? So the research questions are two. What factors affect sustainability of fiscal consolidation in these two countries? And if, and uh, we also want to see if the fiscal consolidation effort that 
focus on the expenditure side are uh, more successful than the ones on the on that uh, focus on tax increase. So those are the two hypotheses that are derived from the, uh, the, the research questions and the research uh, problem that political budget cycles and institutional quality do not affect sustainability of fiscal consolidation in Kenya. Institutional quality speaks to also speaks to the quality of public expenditure, uh, issues to do with the mismanagement of public funds and the rest. So if, if, if we want to see if that can help us to, to, to have sustained uh, uh, fiscal position uh, or fiscal consolidation. And then we also compare with South Africa to see how how they, are, they, they have been able to sustain it for almost uh, 10 years. Then we also, the other hypothesis on fiscal consolidation efforts, focusing on expenditure side, tend to be more successful than the one that favors uh, tax increase. There is this argument that uh, fiscal consolidation uh, uh, focusing on expenditure side should focus on uh, items like reduction of public wages, reduction of recurrent expenditure, but some of these expenditure items, we find that they are politically sensitive. Like you can't just wake up and start uh, rationalizing uh, public, the number of public uh, servants or reducing or capping wage rates. Every year, there is always that pressure to increase, to adjust wages, <laughs> the minimum wages. And this impacts on, on the fiscal consolidation effort. So it will be interesting to see if uh, the ability to, if we focus on which side should we focus on to ensure that uh, we can sustain our fiscal consolidation effort. So some literature there that indicate that uh, uh, focusing on, uh, on primary spending like government consumption and transfer hold uh, greater promise of being sustainable than, than uh, uh, focusing on the tax side. And, the, and then there's also literature on on uh, on on uh, on focus on growth enhancing policies and and uh, cut in public wages and there is also uh, literature on uh, having fiscal rules and uh, but we note that the two countries that we are studying have fiscal rules but the challenge could be in terms of implementation which speaks to issues to do with institutional quality but from the, 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 the little literature that we have reviewed, we have not seen much focus on institutional quality and, uh, and the political economy variables. So that is the empirical uh, model that is derived from the, the model that uh, was used by Alessina in 2017. And uh, I focus on the variables, the, the dependent variables, the fiscal adjustment, which is measured using uh, the gradient approach, and this is computed by the annual reduction in the overall fiscal deficit as a share of GDP. Then we have two sets of uh, fiscal consolidation instruments that we want to use. That is the one on the government uh, on the expenditure side and the ones on the revenues uh, side. They'll be introduced uh, into the model uh, separately because if you if you put all of them in the model, at the same time then there is likely to be a problem of collinearity. Because it's the, it is the revenue that we collect that we use to that uh, inform, uh, that we use to, to cater for this expenditure. So if both of them are in the model, then there is, is likely to be an issue with the, with the, with the, uh, the efficiency of the, of the estimates. Then the other control variables, or the other variables that we, we will want to focus on are the political budget cycle and the institutional quality. And then we control, other control variables are GDP and uh, nominal effective uh, exchange rate. Because with the deterioration of, uh, with the depreciation of the exchange rate, we realize that our budget, our public debt automatically increases. It's like it has a, it impacts on the nominal value of the debt. So we also need to control for that. So data sources, so we intend to do use time series data from 1980 to 2021, and then the, this will be our data source, my data sources. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Alex. So um, we have Ms. Ruth has the 
You're commenting, right? You're discussing. Good morning, everyone. Um, a nice presentation, um, Alex. Sustaining fiscal consolidation efforts in Kenya and uh, South Africa. Uh, generally, the work, um, I thought the work was, um, you know, well uh, stated for preliminary uh, stages. Mm, the first thing was why South Africa and Kenya, because I felt it was not well explained why why you chose South Africa and maybe not uh, a country in East Africa that maybe has same macroeconomic goals with, with Kenya, but you, you've you already explained it. I thought maybe you can include it in your, you know, maybe background on something, uh, uh, justification for using South Africa. Um, also in the background, I think you, you did a lot of um, analysis in Sub-Saharan Africa. I missed something on Kenya and uh, South Africa, I thought maybe we'd see some trends of this debt <coughs> crisis um, in Kenya and South Africa, because what was in the study was um, generally on Sub-Saharan Africa. And the same thing with the uh, fiscal consolidation uh, episodes, especially in South Africa. Um, maybe you, you can include f some stuff like the way you've analyzed for Kenya, highlighting even, you know, um, the periods, you know, like from 1993 to 1997. Maybe we would, as a reader, would love to see more about such episodes um, um, in South Africa. Another thing that um, uh, came out is about um, the hypothesis. Political budget cycles and institutional quality do not affect sustainability of fiscal consolidation in Kenya and South Africa. Um, but now when it comes to, you know, the empirical model and uh, the explanatory variables that are intended to be used, I find out that political budget cycle, institution quali uh, institutional quality are just used like other variables, other control variables, because from my hypothesis, I thought, Maybe they would come out as, you know, the main variables, explanatory variables. Um, maybe you can uh, 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 enlighten that. Uh, as in, I did not really get it why. It's because we are learning, maybe we might get. Then another issue, because um, I, I, I wanted to know, how would you, you know, um, measure political budget cycles? because now we are having the dependent variable being budget deficit. And when you, it comes to political business cycle, I know you must involve um, a budget deficit. Maybe it's something that you can explain further. And uh, generally the work was good. I, I was also confused though you've explained about it, why it's so many variables, like, you know, there are like almost 10 explanatory variables but I think you've uh, talked about it. Generally, the work was good. Thank you. <laughs> Great, thank you. Moses has a comment, and who else has a, a question, comment? Ambrose, <coughs> okay. <coughs> Sorry, thank you. And good work there, Alex. Uh, maybe just uh, some observation that uh, the two countries, Kenya and South Africa, appear to be at par when it comes to debt to GDP ratio because Kenya's current debt to GDP ratio stands at 69.7%. Uh, South Africa is 68.8%. So really you would say the two countries are largely at par so that perhaps if you are looking at the East Africa region and South Africa region, perhaps maybe it would give maybe a better a better comparison or a better view of the same. But that notwithstanding, when you look at the issues to do with fiscal consolidation, largely uh, revolves around the issues to do with the debt to GDP ratio. Uh, the thinking is that when a country has a higher debt to GDP ratio, then it's not doing well. Yet we find uh, countries, like, uh, countries like Japan, 
which is doing fairly well, um, has a debt to GDP ratio of 266%. Uh, a country like um, uh, even the US has a debt to GDP ratio of above 100%. So that now the approach being used by the IMF when it comes to appraising debt is the use of um, the country's debt carrying capacity. How that affects your study perhaps is what maybe uh, I would be interested in, especially considering the issues to do with debt carrying capacity so that a country may have a huge uh, debt to GDP ratio but has a, a higher uh, um, debt carrying capacity. Thank you. Ambrose. Uh, thank you, Alex, for the wonderful presentation. I just would like to get a clarification in what sense you, you're using South Africa, because from the statistics you presented, it seems uh, the, debts are, the debt to GDP ratio is almost the same. South Africa moved from about 28 to 62, and uh, Kenya moved from 32 to 62.1. That's one. Then uh, also from what she mentioned about having uh, those many independent variables, because I understand it's time series and you may run, for example, a vector autoregressive model or vector error correction model or even an autoregressive distributed lag model, which uh, in most cases introduces lags and then lags consume the degrees of freedom. So you would find some variables dropping out. So maybe you try to consider that one. Thank you. Thank you, Amber. We, should we keep going or, yeah. Because we don't have much time, so, and we started a bit late. But Professor Robinson will give, I, so I put a, a, a document in the Dropbox folder with the comments for yesterday, and we'll do the same like written comments, So, because sometimes when you take notes, you forget the idea that they were giving you, so it's better to have the, the, the comments uploaded. So thank you, Alex, and we'll do the same with everyone. And so we'll have three presentations. Professor Robinson will give you feedback, and then th tea break, three more, and then we're off. Okay, so let's, let's, thank you, thank you. Thank you, or I, or I need to clarify something. Okay. Especially on the political budget cycle. So the political budget cycle is measured using the elec election cycles. Like Kenya, we have elect general elections after every five years. So we use a, a dummy variable for the, the year when we have uh, election and the year, uh, and the, I'm yet to, clearly see how to, how, how to do it because what uh, we intend to see is if there's a change in government, is that, does that impact on the physical consolidation impact? So probably the dummy will be after the election, maybe the first year or first two years after after election to see if it impacts on, on, uh, on the revenue. And then on the debt to GDP ratio, I agree with you uh, that uh, higher debt to GDP ratio does not necessarily mean that uh, your debt is unsustainable, so there are other, other parameters that the IMF uses to, to calculate debt sustainability, and uh, we'll review literature on that. Uh, however, for the, 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 the argument or the, the, the argument behind the looking at the debt to GDP ratios is always that your GDP is like your national income, and it is from this your national income, just like an individual, it's from this income that you use to pay your debt. So if, it, if, if you have a higher debt to GDP ratio, it means you are using more of your national income to pay debt, which, is not, which, which, mean, uh, which, mean, which cannot be sustainable even at individual level. If most of your income is going into paying debt, then uh, there are issues to do with the sustainability. So that's, uh, so that's why the debt to GDP ratio is always the parameter or the, the indicator that is used to look at the sustainability of, uh, of, of debt to GDP ratio. Thank you. Uh, otherwise, thank you all for your comments. I'll, I'll incorporate them. Thank you. Thank you. So you're, you're here.
You, okay, so my lab is going to present, and Ambrose is comment is discussing. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'm going to take you through a presentation on the contribution of school and uh, non-school environmental factors that affect uh, pupil performance in Kenya. And uh, I will focus on uh, basic level uh, for standard four and standard six pupils in Kenya. Okay. Okay, yeah. Uh, Kenya implemented the universal primary education policy in 2003. The objective of this policy was actually to ensure that uh, all pupils from uh, irrespective of their background access basic education uh, from standard one up to standard eight. And actually uh, it was achieved because uh, of the gross enrollment rate, which increased uh, from 88% uh, in 2002 to 103% uh, in uh, 2003. And this has been a trend uh, over the two decades since the UPE policy was implemented. Yeah, so, um, however, with the actually uh, as a result, uh, the upsurge in enrollment was in uh, the gross enrollment rate. There's a difference between the gross enrollment and the net enrollment, whereby the gross enrollment is uh, those pupils accessing education irrespective of their age. However, the net enrollment entails those pupils accessing education for the case of Kenya uh, from six to 13 years at uh, basic education, that is at primary education level. Uh, so uh, with this increase also, there was a demand uh, or a strain in the infrastructure because uh, the increase didn't uh, was not commensurate with the uh, uh, facilities in uh, education and learning institutions. Uh, so for instance, we saw the increase in uh, people teacher ratio, uh, the strain in uh, uh, learning materials, among others. So, and the studies have actually been conducted on the same to show that uh, uh, the quality aspect was compromised. So, uh, learner performance uh, at these uh, levels, especially at basic education, uh, the grades are still poor, and uh, reading, uh, we are focusing on reading and numeracy, that is mathematics and uh, languages. Uh, so, uh, uh, why are we focusing on performance? Uh, because of the issue of uh, attaining proficiency. Uh, we realize that uh, uh, impacting skills, uh, especially reading and uh, numeracy at early grades helps a learner to attain proficiency uh, and uh, uh, in other content, actually, yeah. So um, uh, this has uh, led to various reforms in the education sector. Uh, we are implementing uh, competency-based curriculum reforms uh, based on the uh, issue of uh, access being attained but quality being compromised. So the curriculum reforms are actually uh, focusing on the competency-based aspect. Uh, in Kenya, there are uh, globally there are some s methods that are used to assess quality, and uh, I've just sampled a few, like the. Uh, Uezo, the early grade reading assessment, these are at basic level. Uh, when I say basic, I mean the primary education. Uh, the early grade mathematics assessment, the public expenditure tracking surveys and service delivery indicators, this is done by the World Bank, as well as the Southern uh, East and Eastern Africa 
uh, consortium monitoring education quality, among others. So in Kenya at national level, the exams are conducted at uh, standard eight uh, on the previous 844 system, whereby those learners who acquire uh, good marks, they are uh, enrolled or placed in the secondary schools at uh, either the national schools or the extra county schools. And these schools are actually well equipped uh, compared to the uh, secondary day school learning uh, institutions whereby the learners who score lower marks are placed into. So the importance of this, uh, why we are focusing on, uh, on performance because of the quality aspect of education. Uh, the results that are attained are poor, so we want to see which factors are actually leading to uh, this uh, poor performance, irrespective of government uh, putting resources in the education systems. Uh, are there other factors besides the school factors? Could it be an individual or learner characteristics factors? Could it be the environment uh, uh, at home? So those are the factors we want to focus on and see how they impact on performance. Yeah, so um, I've categorized them into three, the school environment factors, the home factors, and the individual. So school environment, I've just uh, picked a few. Some of them will be like the location of the school. Is it an urban school or uh, is it in the rural area? We, we're also looking at the school characteristics in terms of the infrastructure, electricity, uh, issues of ICT, uh, classroom, toilet, among others, the infrastructure at the school level. We're also looking at the learning materials, the books and uh, uh, those learning, uh, teaching and learning resources, uh, the curriculum, how is it being delivered, the method of uh, delivery, uh, which language, at what, uh, which language is it uh, being used to deliver this curriculum, how about the assessments, uh, and then uh, the other aspect will be on teachers, what are the qualities, are their qualifications, what are the numbers, the teacher pupil ratio. Yeah, so these ones actually have an impact on the policy in terms of the quality standards, in terms of the issues of infrastructure, curriculum reforms, and the qualification of teachers. The home factors uh, will include the age of the uh, household head, uh, uh, the socioeconomic status, for example, the income of the household, uh, where the pupil uh, is coming from. Uh, we'll also look at the language this uh, uh, learner speaks at home. And this data is actually available in the uh, public expenditure tracking and the, the service indicator survey, as well as uh, the SACMEC, the Southern and Eastern Africa monitoring quality data. Then we'll also look at the availability of reading materials at home. Uh, they are available, uh, uh, do they vary from learner to another? Does it have an impact on their performance? Yeah, and uh, on the individual characteristics, I'm proposing to use the age of the child in years. Uh, we've uh, seen there's the difference between the gross enrollment rate and the net. Uh, high gross enrollment rate means that uh, this learner has delayed schooling. Eh? They have taken more years in uh, basic education. Then we also look at the gender, uh, female and male, as well as the pupil ability. Uh, so those are the, some of the characteristics or the attributes you are looking at. And uh, this study is motivated by the issue of the quality, the low performance uh, of learner at, early, at, at the early grade level. I said we'll focus on standard four students, yeah. And uh, actually, it will assist also uh, in the new reforms that are being implemented, the curriculum reforms. So it will actually inform on the appropriate policy recommendations. So this leads us to the research objectives, which are as follows on the screen. Uh, we are going to analyze the status of environment that influence uh, children learning in primary schools. So, and we also determine their contribution to the performance. Yeah, we ca you can maybe assist to refine them to read well as the research objectives, but that is uh, actually the aim of the study. These non, uh, uh, the environment factors, which include both school and at home, that affect learner performance. That is actually the key objective of the study. Yeah, so those are the variables. The, my dependent variable will be, um, I'm looking at the reading and numeracy. Uh, so reading test score, 
uh, numeracy will be in terms of mathematics. Uh, and then the school uh, environment, independent variables, the location, I had uh, earlier alluded to them, location, the learner repetition in grade, the school type, is it a public or a private, uh, people teacher ratio, uh, people toilet ratio, textbook, uh, electricity. So those are the school environment, independent uh, variables. Mm, the individual will be age and gender. And then the home environment factors will be the age of the household, uh, the parent level of education, uh, as well as the, uh, the language spoken at home, yeah, and uh, the socioeconomic status, that is the income of the households. Yeah, so those will be my data sources, the public expenditure tracking and service delivery indicator survey uh, that was done is from World Bank. Yeah, and uh, it's for standard four pupils in Kenya. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Milam. Um, Bruce. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation, and uh, I could see there is a gap, and uh, you also have great choice of data. Uh, I just wanted to get a clarification on uh, gross enrollment being uh, beyond 100%. Uh, what that means. But then uh, if we come to the objectives of the study, uh, to me, I felt like uh, we could make them more smart. Uh, for example, objective one where you say, uh, we say analyzing the status of the environment that influence uh, uh, performance. I really don't get how we are going to analyze the status of the environment. Maybe we could have a better way of uh, expressing these objectives. Then the other thing on the on the version of the of the paper you sent me, you had methodology, and I'm surprised you <laughs> you left it out. You didn't present, but if you allow me, I can, because I already figured out some issues in there. But let me just say it out. This is also in relation to the methodology that you intend to use. You say that you're going to use the OLS regression method which is a, a good idea but uh, you did not uh, bring forth the shortcoming of such kind of model that uh, what uh, we have been discussing in the past few days things to do with for example endogeneity because uh, from your presentation i see you already have the age of the household head then you have the age of the child you know as time goes by people tend to give birth and the, as children grow, your age goes up, the kid is also growing older, so there could be some correlation, such issues there. I felt like uh, maybe when writing the methodology, we could be more detailed on what are the possible shortcomings and uh, how we are going to deal with it. Then the other thing is, uh, given that you have four objectives, I didn't get a clear picture of how each objective is going to be answered. Yeah, thank you. Uh, let me end here. Thank you, Ambrose. So does anyone else have a comment or question? Okay. <laughs> Do you want to respond to his comments? A quick one. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Um, uh
on the GR, you ask the meaning. Uh, I said these are the people who go to school uh, irrespective of their age. You can be uh, 18 years or 16 years and you're still at education. However, the net enrollment rate <coughs> is whereby, for, uh, for the case of Kenya, between 6 to 13 years, you should be in primary education. The impact of uh, GER or the implication of it is uh, delayed schooling. Uh, on the objectives, yes, we can make them smarter. Uh, methodology, uh, we'll do, the, of course, the diagnostic test, but I had proposed the regression based on the education production function, whereby the performance will be a function of the uh, s school characteristics, individual, and uh, uh, that affect the, the learner performance. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right. We have Isabella. And Cecilia will come, will discuss. Good morning, everyone. I think now we are moving to another on infrastructure. I think it's the first paper on infrastructure, and we want to see how infrastructure impacts on welfare of Kenyan households. So I, I want to give you a brief um, introduction, just a, a brief uh, a peek on how uh, the power sector in Kenya has been doing because there have been very major changes uh, since the mid 1990s and uh, also uh, in the in 2000s. So uh, during the 1990s, 1995, remember that we were in very serious um, uh, debt situation, and that time we had many donors giving us conditions on how to restructure our public utilities. And at this time, we, there was condition of restructuring the power sector in Kenya. And uh, so uh, funds were frozen, and condition was given that, uh, that Kenya should unbundle the Kenya Power and Lightning Company, which was a utility, was a, was a monopoly at that time. So it was unbundled into generation, transmission, and distribution. Initially, it was just one organization, and there was also a condition that we should allow IPPs in the sector, and two IPPs came into being. Eh? Uh, then an Electric Power Act was established, and also an electricity regulatory board was established as a result of donor, donor conditions that were given at that time. Uh, but this didn't go far in changing the performance of the power sector. But in 2000, uh, during the reign of Mwai Kebaki, the local leaders uh, focused on this sector uh, very much. Eh? And it was focused on as one of the main drivers of development in Kenya. It was seen as an anchor, a key anchor that would propel Kenya to industrialization. So at this time, an energy act was enacted. Uh, KenGen, which is a major uh, generation company, was partially privatized. So we have 30% owned by the private sector and 70% by the government. And the Energy Regulatory Board was transformed into Energy Regulatory Commission with so much power. And also we had establishment of rural electrification authority to propel electrification in the rural areas and get RACO, uh to manage the high power transmission network and also the geothermal development company which has made significant contribution to the geopower development in Kenya. So those are very major changes in the sector. And the motivation of these were socioeconomic development through enhanced access and supply. So that was one of the key drivers of the government to enhance access to the household, to the institutions, eh? and also to, to boost supply of energy in the country. The other one was to support industrialization 
and also to support infrastructure development. So those are the main motivation. But of course, uh, in the donor case, eh, uh, the main motivation was to, to reduce reliance on the government for funding. So, um, so I also wanted to give you a peek on the poverty situation on Kenya, since we are talking about welfare here. And we see, although we have been saying that Kenya economy has been growing over time, we find that there are still very poor people in Kenya. And for example, in 2015, we see that uh, the population whose consumption expenditure is below 3,000. 3,000 is very little money in rural areas, and 5,000, almost 6,000 in the urban areas is 36%. And the population that is food poor is around 32%. So we are still in very, despite the changes that we are seeing in infrastructure, we still have very high poverty situations that are not acceptable. So the question that we want to ask in this paper, what contribution has infrastructure played eh, uh, in improving, in uh, impacting on the household welfare? And particularly, we are trying to look at uh, electricity. Uh, and uh, as we know, the access to electricity in Kenya has really grown since these reforms. Eh? We can say at more than 70% of Kenyan households are electrified, which is a very huge growth eh, in access. But is it impacting on the Kenyan households? So, um, so that, that is a question that we want to ask. Eh? And I also say that we can also ask other question on how this has impacted on education and also in labor dynamics. Eh? But in this proposal that I'm giving here, we are only focusing on, uh, on household income, how access to electricity has impacted on household income. So uh, do we have more household, for example, uh, carrying out more businesses that require electricity? Has maybe income from the agricultural sector improved? or wherever other sources, eh, other businesses that require electricity access, have they improved the household income? So that is a question that I have. But in this part, I, I, I see problems that I would like uh, you to think about and maybe give me uh, your suggestion on how to deal with them. Eh? Because you see household income and a connection to electricity uh, they are possible, they are likely to be, uh, you, one wouldn't know what, what direction uh, the impact is on, eh? whether it's how it was income that influences connection or is the connection to the grid that improves household income. And also another challenge is on the spillover effect. This one, I, was also, I would also like to hear your comments uh, because in Kenya, when a household is connected, it's likely, it's, we are likely to have spillover effect the neighbors, we are social people. So uh, if my household is connected, my neighbor is likely to have uh, some positive effect, impact, as a result of that connection. So there are two areas that I would like to hear your comment uh, on how to probably deal with them. Then um, I had proposed, I'm proposing two uh, possible methods of analysis. And so this is also another issue where I would like to hear your comments. One is instrumental variable estimation. So uh, a possible instrument for electrification status in a household. And uh, the other method I'm proposing is probably to use pooled OLS regression because we have very rich data in Kenya on households uh, that is collected by the Kenya National uh, Household Budget Survey. So, um, so uh, that is the data that we propose to use. We have data on from 2005, 2006, and 2015, 2016, Kenya Integrated Household Budget Survey, which is a very rich data on household characteristics and it has also data on energy use. In fact, the model for energy use col has collected data on energy use, energy cost, among other areas. So it's a very rich data that can probably answer this question. Thank you. Thank you, Isabella. Thank you. We have um, Cecilia discussing 
Isabella. Okay. Uh, can, is this working? Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh. Okay, okay. So first of all, apologies for coming in late. Uh, really sorry for that. And thank you, Isabella, for the wonderful presentation. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I'm not going to help you answer the questions. I'm going to raise more questions <laughs> from your topic. So uh, first of all, um, the, the, your topic and w the contents uh, is a bit different. When I saw, I saw the impact. Is it the impact of of electric electricity reforms on household welfare? But when you get into the reading, it's about electricity connection. So because I was expecting to see a list of reforms and maybe indicators for those reforms, because I'm sure electricity connection is not the only reform that has been there. Maybe the changes in tariffs, maybe the pro, pro poor tariffs, are they having an impact on household income? So I was expecting more than just uh, electricity connection. And then if it is just electricity connection, then let your topic be, be very clear that it is electricity connection. And then uh, also, uh, I was also wondering why household income, uh, given that we know household income is determined by so many other factors. So even if you find there is a relationship, the, the aspect of attributing uh, that, that in increase to electricity will be a bit different because you know there are so many other factors. Unless you are just looking at people who are doing business, so before they got electricity and after they got electricity in their business place, so has their income increased? Unless you go directly to maybe you target a certain respondent, but if you target maybe just uh, households, no matter which uh, business or which activity they are involved in, it will be a bit different. So maybe you do like a before and after. Before you got uh, access or um, connection to electricity, what has happened to your, to your income after that, then it will be a bit easier to attribute the increase in income to, to electricity. And then also I was wondering um, why you didn't, the, you need to justify why income, why not health? We know that we, when households get uh, access to electricity, they, they reduce their, their dependence on uh, kerosene, which has health effects. Why not education? Maybe children are able to study more in the night than um, when it's just purely households without looking at the whatever activity. Maybe you should consider other welfare welfare indicators other than income. Maybe that's just a thought. Or maybe uh, maybe you'll justify why income, and that will be all right, because you, you know your literature, and maybe you can convince us why, why income. And then, um, uh, the issue of uh, reverse causality is also you've already raised. Whether really is it income that is increasing your access or is it access that is increasing your income? So that's, that's also something to, to, to consider. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that's all from me. It's yeah. just mo more questions, really. Yes. So for the, the other questions you've raised on which, which model, which methodology to use, I think the economists and the econometricians in the house can really help you with that. Thank you. Those were excellent comments. Thank you, Cecilia. Um, okay, does anyone else have comments or suggestions? Okay. So it's Professor Robinson's turn to, to give you feedback.
could be that whatever you do in steady state, you end up with the same debt to GDP ratio. So if I just forgive some of your debt today, then you automatically accumulate back to a kind of, there's some sort of global attractor. Or it could be that somehow I put you into a different equilibrium because by forgiving your debt, you know, I, you know I, I somehow allow you to more space to provide public goods and that increases productivity and then there's some sort of virtuous circle. And so, so I think that's a sort of freestanding question, it seems to me. I don't know if you want to work on that and I don't know the literature on it, but it seems very interesting. I think, I mean, this was something that came up in the comments. You know, you're not, ma fiscal consolidation, like who cares about fiscal consolidation, right? That's not a welfare criterion. You're not trying to maximize fiscal consolidation. You know, you're trying to maximize, you know, welfare, and that involves public good provision, it involves, you know, economic growth, it involves, you know, all, all that sort of stuff. So, you know, why might you accumulate debt? Well, Kenya is a poor country, you know, so, in the theory of economic growth, you'd expect factors of production to be highly productive. You know, if you believe in diminishing marginal productivity, then investment, the return to investments would be really high, right? So that's why we think that, you know, developing countries should be borrowing. How much should they be borrowing? I don't know what the answer to that is. You know, like the, what Moses was saying is, well, you know, it's pretty uncorrelated growth and debt to GDP ratio. So there's many factors that determine whether you're allocating these revenues actually to public good provision or it's being misallocated or whatever it is. But I just think that I found it difficult to think of fiscal, like what are you, why are you doing fiscal consolidation? Like that's not what you're maximizing. It's not a welfare criterion. So, and I just think like leaving aside this question about HIPIC, you know, which seems like a project on its own. If you want to focus on this Kenya, South Africa thing, you know I'm going to say there's way too many variables in your empirical model. So if you're going to focus on this South Africa, Kenya thing, I think you need a, a puzzle. You know, you need a puzzle. You need like South Africa and Kenya get hit by the same shock, you know, COVID-19, although I guess South Africa got hit much more by COVID-19 than Kenya did. I don't know why that is. My friends in Nigeria say because no, there's not enough malaria in South Africa, you know. So the South Africans don't have malaria, so they're not, they can't deal with COVID. But in Nigeria, we have malaria, so we can, anyway, I'm not a doctor, medical doctor. Like, what, I'm not a useful doctor. I'm the kind of useless type of doctor. So, so, but leaving that aside, you know, you're hit with the same shock. Uh, Kenya and South Africa are hit with the same shock, but they react in very different ways with very different consequences for the debt to GDP ratio. Why do they react in different ways? Is that to do with expenditure? Or is it to do with, you know, the revenue side of things? You know, like I think you need a kind of puzzle which allows you to probe how South Africa and Kenya are different. I didn't quite see that. I don't know if there's a puzzle about the political business cycle and Kenya has a political business cycle and South Africa doesn't have a political business cycle. And the reason is something to do with the way the politics works or the state works or the revenue authority. I don't know. So I think, you know, we can talk about it uh, over tea or whatever, you know, uh, but, but, but I think like to push that, I couldn't quite see where that Kenya South Africa comparison was going or what, what the puzzle, what the puzzle was. So, so, or, you know, how to kind of compare so I think that, you know, if you're going to go down that road, I would start, before you run that incredibly complicated econometric model with all those explanatory variables, I would, like, try to zoom in on, on, on some sort of more case study and think about it. You know, the whole story of the revenue authority in South Africa, you know, you were saying South Africa are kind of very good at raising revenue, you know. That, that's a lot to do with the transition from apartheid when Pravin Gordon was head of the Revenue Authority. They kind of, they understood that, that if they were going to create a new South Africa, they needed resources to try to invest, you know, in, in massively marginalized and exploited African communities. You know, you drive about South Africa, you see all these new houses everywhere in the townships, the people have electricity, they have new houses. Where did all that resources come from? That's where it came from, you know. So, so I think that's a, that's a very interesting political story about the necessity to invest in previously, you know, m people who were massively marginalized and discriminated against during the apartheid period. Now, maybe there's no analogy to that in Kenya, or maybe there is an analogy. I, I, don't, I, I just think, I'm just trying to see like where the, 
you know, like, w like, why do I want to compare Kenya and South Africa? I think that that needs something. There's something missing there. Okay, but 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 anyway, great. Um, all right, where are my other comments? Here, uh, Melap. Uh, so I think you know this is a, obviously this is a great it's a great question. <laughs> you, you know exactly what I'm going to say. <laughs> there's like you know. There's huge kind of academic literature. Lit you know, obviously, this is a very important policy question in Kenya. You know, there's been this transition, free primary education. On one hand, it seems to have succeeded. On the other hand, you know, it's been disappointed in terms of this quality of education. And how do we understand why that is? Somehow, it's kind of maybe it's necessary, but it's not sufficient to have universal private universal primary education because you need all these other complementary inputs to, to work. And I think, you know, you had a very rich sense of what that is. Um, you know, all these different things you talked about, you know, there's enormous literatures in economics on this stuff like pupil teacher ratio and the quality of teacher, you know, Raj Chetty did all this work on kind of teacher fixed effects and like how the quality of teacher and peer effects and so, I mean, I'm not an expert on this literature, but you know, it seems like if one was going to write an academic paper about this, then, then in some sense you have to zoom in on a story. You know, you have to, like all these things, yeah, all these variables are important, but like acad most papers would be about one thing. And I wonder, is there something special about, you know, one way to think about this, I was trying to think when you were talking, and I don't know enough about Kenya maybe to answer this question is, is there something distinct about Kenya? You know, is there something special about Kenya where we can learn something kind of generally about these problems? You know, every country in the world has these problems. The US has these problems. You know, England has these problems. Kenya has these problems. So, so this is not a sort of specific Africa type issue, you know. It's, uh, you know, but of course, nor is debt consolidation, you know, or the impact of electricity. I'm going to say in a minute, talk about India in a minute, but, but, so, but is that like one thing which would be particularly nice would be to think about, is there something really African about this? Like yesterday when Blessing was talking, for example, you know, it struck me that one thing about African society, you know, which was, is very different from Western society, which might be relevant for resilience is the fact that African society is much more collectivist, you know, it's much more people are much more part of a community, you know, uh, Isabella was talking about that when she was talking about spillovers, you know, so it's not like if I have electricity in my house, you know, like, who cares what, you know, in Hyde Park, you know, like in Chicago, who cares about the neighbors? It's not like I'm going to share electricity with the neighbors or the neighbors kids are going to come and, you know, that now they can read their books in the evening because I have electricity. So there's all sorts of spillover effects. It's not everybody's not an island, you know. Uh, but I, I wonder if there's, you know, this is something we could discuss. Is there something about the Kenya context which is really distinct, which will allow me to say, you know, here's something about Kenya which is, you know, which can really tell us something new about this educational production function or, you know, what would be necessary to raise the quality. Is that about Kenyan society or about the sort of social embeddedness of the school in society? You know, my mother was a head teacher and she used to, she was a head teacher of a school in Coventry in England and then this was like young kids starting at the age of five you know so and then she realized well five is too late already you know like by the time kids are five they're so socialized into particular ways of behaving that it's really difficult to kind of do anything so then she realized that she had to get all the mothers to bring so she'd have all this free food free tea free coffee free cakes She'd get all the mothers to bring the babies before five into the school and they'd have these meetings every day and they'd talk about the kids and getting the kids reading and stuff. And, and the biggest problem was that most of the mothers didn't have, you know, male partners. So they were like single mothers, they were unmarried, you know, so they had all sorts of problems, financial problems, problems with caring. So then my, my mother organized all of this kind of kindergarten and like child, she mobilized money to kind of help so the women could work and they'd have more money. And so, so the way I think about these things is like the, inter you know, because of my personal experience with my mother is that the sort of social embeddedness, even in Coventry, you know, if you've been to Coventry, you'll know what I mean. I don't recommend the experience, but, but even in Coventry, the sort of the social embeddedness of learning was like really critical, you know, 
But Kenyan society is like super different from, from, from I, I don't know, I'm, I'm just making this up, but I think like it would be fun to think through, there's something Kenya specific about this issue that Raj Chetty or whoever it is hasn't thought about, but I'm too ignorant you know, to be able to say anything about it. I think Isabella, you know, we have a colleague at the University of Chicago, Fiona Berlig, who did her PhD dissertation on exactly these questions in uh, India, you know, and, and so I think, like, I think it's a super question, so it's really, really important, you know, like, I, wor I worked a lot in Sierra Leone, and in Sierra Leone, people are so obsessed with electricity, there's no electricity, you know, except in Freetown and a couple of cities, but it's like, it's incredible. It's so visceral, the topic of electricity and access to electricity and, uh, and all these consequences that C Cecilia also kind of thought, I think, had that like these ideas were great about, oh, suddenly your kids can read. Like, what about the education? What about the consequences for health? You know, now you're not using kerosene or some other, you know, kind of, you know, so cooking materials, you, I don't know, firewood or whatever, even less healthy. Uh, but I think, like, you know, the, here the crucial thing is, like, I would say, you know, these, this survey data you're looking at seems really interesting, but, like, what about the rollout? So in Fiona's paper, she exploits this kind of staggered rollout. So there's a lot of empirical papers that use a kind of staggered rollout in the sense that these places get rolled out, and often, you know, what you look at is so their sort of balance. So it's not random, it's not like anyone's randomly kind of creating access to electricity but it gets rolled out in a relatively logical way, but it turns out that many of the places are ki can be comparable, so you have a control group. So it gets rolled out to one district or whatever, or one county, uh, uh, and not to another county. Maybe that other county gets it later, but that's okay. You, know, you, you, you have a period in time where you have a treatment and a control group, and, and that's basically what Fiona did. And there's a lot of empirical papers, I can make some suggestions, where where, you, where they use that strategy. You know, there's a very nice paper about Fox News, you know, which is this hideous right-wing cable television in America, you know. Uh, but it, rolled, it got rolled out in a sort of staggered way. So then it's not randomly assigned, but you can, like, do this balance comparison and things like that. So I, I don't know what information, you didn't talk about what information you have about how this expansion of electricity took place. But my, the first thing I'd do would be to look at that. You also mentioned this, I didn't understand like these local leaders, what they do exactly and you know, how much uh, freedom they have for determining things. I didn't understand, you, know, you only have 10 minutes to present. So, so I think that's what we, sh you know, we should talk about this rollout and, and, and can we learn more about the rollout? And that could give you a very powerful way, I think, of kind of identifying the reduced form effect of this thing on income, that, but, I, but I agree that there's going to be lots of impacts of this. And I think there's this idea of, you know, that, that there's going to be these spillovers is very interesting, you know, and perhaps the spillovers depend on, you know, the nature of the local society. You know, there's a lot of kind of sociological variation within Kenya. That would be really interesting to look at. That's not something that Fiona thought about at all when she's looking in India. So that, that would be a fun kind of, you know, specific Kenyan thing to think about um, too. You know, there's a very recent a paper about this enormous cash transfer program in Kenya by Ted Miguel and a bunch of other economists looking at, you know, what's the impact of like giving people, you know, money, like money. So, so this cash transfer stuff that the economists are obsessed with. But what's really interesting about that is it's like the, the, the fact that, you know, you're in this society with you, which as you say, you know, you're Kenyan, so you understand this. There's all these spillovers and interconnections and people share resources and things like that. Since they're Americans, they have no idea that things like that go on in Kenya. So it's very, very badly conceptualized, these spillovers. So I think that could also be a very nice contribution, you know, to, to sort of say the context is very important to understanding this impact of this electrification in a way that, you know, is not true in India, maybe, or in the United States or whatever. So, so that's a great, great, I love that idea, yeah. Okay. All right. We're having a. Oh, we're having tea break. Right? We're having a tea break. But a very disciplined one. Yes, <laughs> because we have to finish early today. All right. No, we're on time. <laughs> yes, you're right. Yes. <laughs> on time, sharp, sharp <laughs> noon.
Okay. We're ready. We're ah, they are not ready. Okay. <laughs> Good morning once again. Okay, um, Ruth Moinga, University of Nairobi, a CPP student. My research topic is on assessing fiscal sustainability in Kenya. Initially, that was uh, my idea, but I'm still considering uh, checking on uh, uh, East African community, the, the member states in East African community, maybe after. So that's why I just wrote slash uh, ESC there. So in introduction, uh, first uh, is to understand what is uh, fiscal su sustainability. And in this case, we say that it is a situation in which a government is expected to be able to uh, continue servicing the debt without either restructuring the, the debt or even defaulting the debt or even you know, doing a realistic adjustment to uh, public expenditure and even the public revenues. Then another key thing that I'll consider is fiscal reaction functions. And uh, one of the definition by this researcher, Baga and others in 2011, they said that fiscal reaction function normally specify the reaction of the uh, primary balance, which uh, is the ratio of GDP to changes in the lagged public debt GDP ratio. So uh, that tells you that then we need to see how the Kenyan government or East African um, governments, they react to uh, changes in um, debt ratio. Okay, um, also another work done by Bonn, um, they tried to explain and elaborate further about fiscal reaction function and using error correction uh, mechanisms, they, they said that if public debt uh, GDP ratio tries to increase, then the government should respond by either improving, uh, I mean, by improving the primary bar uh, balance so that they can arrest or even reverse the rise in debt um, GDP. Then what motivated me to this uh, topic one thing is that sustainable fiscal policy is very crucial for macroeconomic um, stability. We know that one of the major objectives or goals of fiscal policy is to ensure that there is economic growth in a country, to ensure that there is price stability, to ensure that there is economic freedom, among others. Another thing is that when you look at the fiscal space in Kenya, it is kind of constrained by the growth of public expenditure. And you know, with also the persistent economic development needs that are there in terms of infrastructure and other development goals. And as a result of this growth in public expenditure, one thing that is peculiar is that fiscal deficits have been rising and you know, widening over years. And this is despite, you know, the tax reforms that have been there, you know, that have been set or you know, formed that need to match the public expenditure with the public revenue. Another thing is based on the targets that we have, especially for fiscal deficit GDP ratio and even the public debt GDP ratio. For instance, in Kenya, um, I, I cannot remember very well the strategy, but it was said that the state target should be less than 3.6% of the GDP. When you look at the East, Af uh, East African community in general, they, uh, they've also set their development strategies and one of the targets is uh, about the fiscal deficit GDP ratio and it is expected to be less, in fact it is less than 5%, I believe that was uh, a typo there, should be less than 5%. Um, of the GDP, and also when, when you look at those targets of East, uh, East African community, uh, the, public, um, the, the public debt should also be uh, manageable. But when you look at whatever has been happening, for instance, the current situation in Kenya, 
the G, uh, fiscal GDP, uh, fiscal deficit uh, ratio of GDP, and this is excluding uh, grants, you realize that it, is, uh, it was at 8.7% in 2020, 2021 financial year. This is way off, you know, the 3.6% and even the 5% that is required for ESE. And the same case, uh, when you look at the total public debt uh, in Kenya, it's still growing. And recently we've even had to, you know, adjust the threshold of the debt because it is currently wanting. Another uh, motivation to this study is the fact that unsustainable fiscal policy is very ex uh, expensive for any uh, country. For instance, um, fiscal unsustain uh, unsustainability can lead to fiscal policy, uh, the loss of fiscal policy flexibility. And you know, with this kind of uh, laws, then it means that we are not able to react to any shocks. The government is not able to react to any shocks in the economy. Another um, implication is that uh, unsustainable fiscal policy would lead to reduction in resources available for priority spending. And we've all experienced that, that you have to divert some resources that are meant for either development and other social services to at least service the debt. And finally, it is also harmful to the economy, um, to the economic growth, and why? Because with this debt servicing and increase in interest rate, then it means that there would be crowding out of private investment, which is very crucial for economic growth in a country. Finally, on um, motivation is that when you look at this particular topic, and especially in Kenya, and generally in ESE, there are very few studies that have worked on this. And um, also another thing that I wanted to bring into this idea is about um, election timing. And most of the studies that have been done, they've not really considered uh, whether election timing is, you know, it is crucial when it comes to sustainability of fiscal policy. Does it, does it change when it comes to election years um, or not. Then uh, I just tried to put some trends of the fiscal deficit GDP ratio and even, you know, the government expenditure uh, and the tax revenue. And one thing that you will learn that the, the, the gray area that is sh uh, shaded there represents the electioneering period, which is uh, one year before the election, election year and the year after election. And one thing that you will note about uh, the election is that uh, just before an election, for example, in 2001, um, if you can look at, um, is it the blue one? Uh, okay, I'm not able to project there, but if you look at the, the, the blue uh, one that, you know, uh, uh, symbolizes the uh, defo uh, deficit, you can see during the election period, the deficit is kind of, you know, uh, increasing. You can also see uh, for the 2000 and, uh, 2006, 2007 period, though it, it was kind of, you know, increasing before election and then it went down after election and immediately after, we can see fiscal deficit uh, increasing. And the same case applies to 2013, 2014 period. Uh, there's also an upward trend in uh, fiscal deficit, which also the same case in um, the period between 2016, uh, 2015 and uh, uh, 2016 and 2018, when we were having uh, elections. So this is what uh, motivated me to think about can election uh, timing, you know, change uh, this uh, uh, sustainability. So those are um, other trends that, like I've said before. So my research questions that I I propose here is that is fiscal uh, policy sustainable in Kenya or is it sustainable, you know, in ESC countries because it is possible to work on that? Then what is the Kenya's fiscal reaction function? And finally is that does election timing matter in this case? There are some objectives that are formulated from those research questions to be able to establish whether fiscal policy in Kenya is sustainable, to determine Kenya's fiscal policy um, reaction function, to establish whether election uh, timings 
affect fiscal policy reaction function in Kenya. So when it comes to methodology, I'm planning to uh, source my data from uh, World Bank, uh, WDI, um, uh, IFS, um, um, World, uh, World Economic Outlook, and even our Kenya Bureau of Statistics. Some of the proposed variables as per now, the dependent variable is uh, primary uh, balance where we take uh, the fiscal deficit and uh, slash the surplus. Then uh, the explanatory variables would be lagged primary balance, uh, public debt, lagged uh, public debt and other control variables like, you know, a dummy for elections, a dummy for, um, I mean, a dummy for election year and another one for the period when we, we don't have uh, elections. And finally, the estimation technique I'm proposing to use uh, uh, ARDL because when you look at the, my model, because of the lagged dependent uh, variable, it would be a dynamic model. So I think uh, this technique would be good so that I can see short run and long run analysis of sustainability uh, in Kenya. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Ruth. So we, I think we have Alex commenting on. Yeah. Alex. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth, for the presentation uh, and uh, the interesting topic. I know a number of studies have been done in this area, but. Uh, Every now and then, uh, some issues will uh, always come up. Huh? So, so just to begin with, I think. Uh, okay, thank you for the presentation and uh, for the interesting topic. I know this is uh, an area that uh, some work has been done. And uh, however, uh, uh, every now and then, some issues come up that uh, you need to uh, research on. And so my first comment will be on uh, your motivation of the study and uh, the research gap. Uh, because there is a paper that was done in 2020 by, by Kipra. That is Kipra discussion paper DP240 by Helen Chemnyogoi and uh, Kiriga. So, so you need to look at that paper and see how differently yours is, uh, what, what is, how, how differently you are going to approach uh, your analysis because they, they, they found out that uh, the fiscal uh, uh, position of Kenya is uh, weakly, weakly sustainable. So I don't know what they meant by that, but uh, you, 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 it will be interesting for you to also review that paper and see how, how, how you are going to do a, you as differently because you are likely to get uh, a different result or something has happened since they did the analysis. Of course, we have had COVID and, 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 and such kind of things. So, so it would be interesting to bring out what is it that uh, you are looking at differently th as compared to what the other studies have, have, uh, have done. <laughs> That's the alarm. Yeah. Okay, okay. So, so, so by that, uh, you need to adequately motivate uh, your study in terms of uh, bringing in the stylized facts about fiscal sustainability. When do we consider uh, our fiscal position to be unsustainable? What are the stylized facts by, let's say, uh, international bodies like IMF? Uh, what are the wh what are the indicators? You need to have those indicators when you are introducing your your your, your paper. Then uh, you also need to combine the, the the graph you had on government expenditure and tax revenue. It will be interesting if you can combine uh, the them, you put them in the same graph, then you, you try and bring out the, the gap between the tax revenue and government expenditure. Government expenditure could be growing faster than uh, the tax, expenditure, uh, tax revenue, and therefore that could be resulting into uh, a growth in fiscal deficit, which has to be funded from other sources. And this could be contributing to the unsustainability of our fiscal position. So you, that story needs to come out clearly when you are introducing the, the topic. Then, uh, then there's also, I, I didn't, from the research questions, I didn't really understand why you are 
we wanted to look at physical reaction function uh, because I remember uh, this one when you we were at Kipra in 2015, a colleague of mine called Cyrus Mutuku did a, a study in this area uh, in 2015. And one interesting question he was bringing out was on uh, how to, to manage our fiscal policy. Like for monetary policy, we have the CBK here. Yeah? Should we, uh, on the other wing of fiscal pol pol policy, should we have a, a fiscal policy authority? I found that, that was a very interesting argument, and maybe you can uh, look at 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 at, at uh, that at it on that uh, aspect because even in that area there are uh, there are a number of studies that have been done, the latest one being in around 2018-2019. So you need to clearly come out what research gap you are going to fill, uh, so that it is not seen like we are just uh, repeating what has been done before. Then uh, on the research. Uh, uh, I understand this study is still at the formative stage, so the research problem has uh, not been well defined as Prof was talking about uh, VPH, eh? looking at the variation, the puzzle, and then you come up with the hypothesis. So, so, so you need to look at uh, the, the, what the, the, the focus, the variable that we are focusing on, what has been the variation in the, in the recent uh, uh, years or over the years. And what is the puzzle? What are the consequences of not uh, uh, ensuring sustainability of our fiscal position? Uh, like uh, you need to talk about the constrained environment for domestic resource mobilization and, and maybe the increasing pressure to, 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 to increase expenditure because of uh, COVID to stimulate the economy, economic recovery post COVID there are also issues to do with the enhancing so social protection. We also had physical pressures that came with the rollout of the devolution in, uh, in, 2020, in 2013, yeah, when we, we moved to the new, uh, the, the devolved system of government. We have had uh, uh, increased pressure and there have always been demands from the 47 devolved government for the central, the national government to increase the transfers to to the devolved government. So you also need to, to bring in that aspect of increase, uh, the pressure to increase expenditure, while on the other hand, we have a constrained environment for, uh, for, for revenue collection. So that you come up with a puzzle and then a hypothesis on, uh, on, uh, from the puzzle, so that it is very clear, this is the research problem, this is the puzzle, this is the, and this is the, hypo what, we are hypothesizing, and this is the hypothesis we are going to test. Then on the methodology, this one is still also on the formative stage, and uh, I believe at this, at this, at the moment, you can which, which estimation uh, technique you'll use, unle uh, unless you already have the data and you have done some diagnog no diagnostic text tests and seen how how that data is behaving, is when now you can tell which is the appropriate uh, estimation technique to use. So, 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 so before that, you, 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 before that, you, you just need to define clearly define the variables, uh, uh, so that it's clear how you are going to measure issues to do with the fiscal sustainability. Are you going to use the the IMF indicators, or you are going to define a different indicator? Yeah. So those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Does anyone have comments for for Ruth or questions? Lydia and Ambrose. Okay, and Cecilia. Okay, mine is more of a, an addition. Uh, uh, to, when you're doing this research, I think you should also try to to add more knowledge, to add more information on the fact that um, we also we still we have uh, fiscal policies that have been uh, initiated already by the government. The way uh, Alex was saying that has allowed for the optimum optimum uh, allocation of resources, especially through devolution. 
So you can try and talk of uh, the, the fiscal policies that have already been implemented that are actually having positive impacts on the, on the economy. And of course, I think you can also, at the end of this study, try to recommend some fiscal policies that uh, the, the Kenyan government does not want to touch on that actually ensure price stability. We, we know the Kenyan government doesn't know how to do that. It doesn't like uh, doing price stability and policies that encourage uh, full employment and uh, economic stability. So I think the only fiscal policy that the Kenyan government is doing is the optimum allocation of resources, not tax cuts, at, not really tax cuts. So you can try to look at what have the government done, what fiscal policies have they implemented to date. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I just wanted to bring to your attention that the there is a paper by by Enoch Bulime, Ibrahim Mukisan, Professor Edward Bale that he looks at public debt sustainability and estimating the fiscal reaction function for Uganda. Maybe you can use that one as a guide to help you because they did all those things you state in your objectives. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so thank you, Ruth, for that. It was really interesting. Uh, from the perspective of a person who really doesn't understand about fiscal, fiscal issues, I think what, what was very interesting for me was that, that increase, that sort of a correlation with the electioneering period. I think that's, for me, that's a puzzle from my side. Uh, maybe you can explore more why, why that is happening and is it a unique case in Kenya? And even whether there's a difference whether uh, the person running is an incumbent or a, a, new, a new election altogether, is it any different? And what can be done maybe to, to somehow have a, a sta a st some kind of stability? How can you reduce that, that r major variation? And also, yeah, look into whether is it a unique Kenyan case or is it a case of maybe our elections are too too costly? I don't know. I, I'm really curious about why that is happening. Uh, thank you. Dennis. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, Ruthie, uh, thank you very much for for your presentation. I think uh, you have a very good topic to research on. And uh, while you displayed your topic, uh, then I just uh, tried to look around and get to know what it, is it all about. Then I, ca I, I, I found it very interesting. And uh, there is a paper uh, that I've seen uh, with, the, with, the, with the title of uh, Fiscal Policy and Public Debt in Kenya uh, from uh, Kenyatta University. Of course, I think it has a lot of insights. And uh, I've realized that uh, uh, this thing is very critical uh, because uh, they, they, they have talked of... Uh, the fiscal balance GDP ratio being wasn't from uh, a surplus of 0.2 percent uh, to the fist of 7.6 percent, while the debt to GDP ratio rose from 25 to 56 percent. That is between uh, 1963 to 2015. So you can see how uh, this thing is is very serious. And uh, for me, I think it is uh, in most of the African countries. That, that debt stabilization is, is not our priority. Uh, of course, you talked uh, about the election. I understand that during the election, there are some of the sponsors, you know, maybe the businessmen and businesswomen that are sponsoring these election, uh, elections. So what are they expecting after someone has uh, entered into the office, the one that has been sponsored by uh, uh, those uh, business uh, 
giants. I think they're expecting uh, a, a payback of what they have spent during the election. So maybe uh, there will uh, there'll be some of the white elephant projects for these guys maybe to uh, get paid on what they have invested during the election and so forth. So maybe we'll, you'll also need to look around on, 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 on that uh, uh, category. Yeah, thank you. That, that is my uh, contribution. Thank you. I think we should get going. So, and, but I'll make an announcement for Monday. On Monday, we had assigned readings on econometrics and models, but because it's fair to have the online presenters uh, presenting, <laughs> so we'll do a, a four-hour session of online presentations with our peers in, in around Africa. Um, and then there's a party, so we get to celebrate our presentations. And we are going to rearrange the syllabus during the weekend, so we give you a precise re like information on what are the readings and what to expect next week. So think that what is there, it's like, they are, they are, I'm sure we will cover some of the papers so you can start reading, but for example, the lecture on Monday, I don't think we're doing that, right? We're not doing anguish and pishki. Let's talk about the topic. Ah, okay. So we, we might, and the other announcement is that uh, since we are going to have like a round table where we actively want you to comment or like give us ideas on <coughs> Africa's latent asset assets. We would like that paper for sure. Please read it during the weekend. That's mandatory. If you don't, we'll be sad. So that's <laughs> that's on lecture. So and then through the week we can start work. Like you'll have time to reflect on what the, the content of the paper. And then on Friday, 25th, which is like the program uh, lecture moment to discuss in depth this paper. We want to hear your ideas. So, that, and okay, yes, that's that's the an end of the announcement. We are going to go with Lydia, and John will comment on Lydia. Hello. Um, as you know, my name is Lydia Cheruto, University of Nairobi CPP. And um, I, I apologize in advance because uh, my lower respiratory system is operating below optimum. <laughs> so, um, uh, and what, uh, this is an idea that I had after reviewing some data, and I'm also trying to come up, uh, up to date with the uh, problems that are affecting Kenya. And actually, the sometimes problems comes, come from solutions, if the solutions are not implemented well. So my topic is on the impact of institutional systems and resource capacity on gross uh, county product in Kenya. Uh, I got a correction yesterday and I've already implemented it. So, it is impact of institutional systems and resource capacity on growth in gross county product. Okay? So, I'm supposed to be controlling this. Huh? So the outline, I'll work on the background, the research question, methodology, data sources. The references will be in the book, in the, in the pamphlet that I had. So um, this is the motivation for this particular research, that uh, despite uh, devolution of resources and functions from the national government to county governments, that is uh, after the, the, the new constitution that was formulated in 2010, uh, functions and resources were devolved from the national government to county government, 
And in Kenya, there was formation of 47 counties headed by governors, and actually which the speakers as the head of the legislature and being the watchdog of the executive. So despite this devolution of functions and resources, some counties still perform poorly in terms of growth in gross county output, which, which has now led the research to investigate. Among many other factors, what are the impacts of the institutional system and resource capacity on gross county output? So um, when we look at the background, we find that uh, financial and technological advancement have fostered uh, speedy economic growth in Africa and in the world. And institutions create favorable environments for creation, inspiration, new opportunities and competition. So while few leaders in Africa adopt economic policies desirable for economic growth, the majority do not adopt these good policies. And Kenya is an example of that. So what is the research question? So what are the impacts of institutional system and resource capacity on the gross county output? So um, the new constitution uh, ensured that the national government roles, for example, the ECD, early childhood education, are now managed by the county government. Infrastructure development, some infrastructure uh, by, the national, by the county government. We have a devolution of health. Health is now managed at the county level. We also have the own source revenue collection done at the county level and many other functions, including also civic education and public participation. That is also done at the county level. So these devolved functions, if a county doesn't have the capacity to implement them, it actually has an impact on the gross county, on the growth in the gross county product. So um, the, the core agenda or, uh, or intention for this uh, decentralization is quick service delivery and equitable resource distribution. And as well as participation, we need the, the citizens to participate in the decision making of the county. So uh, something that I also wanted to add to this, okay, I'll add at the end. So the dependent variable is the growth in gross county outputs. So the independent variables are the public finance. Actually, in, in a whole, this is the capacity, but we are able to branch into this um, five, uh, let's say four or five key indicators. And uh, this was gotten from the World Bank research that was done through the Kenya Devolution Support Program. I was lucky to be one of the assessors. So we collected uh, primary data from all the 47 counties and it has been going on for four years. So every year we, we collect data and see what changes these uh, guys make. And we also give grants, development grants based on performance. So the data, we have some indicators. And in the indicators, we allocate weights so that we can be able to quantify your capacity when it comes to public finance management, uh, planning, monitoring, and evaluation, human resource, performance management, devolution and intergovernmental relations, civic education and public participation. So an ex I want to use an example of the planning, monitoring and evaluation. So when you check into the indicators of that, we look at does a county have a county integrated development plan designed according to the framework? Does a county have an annual development plan? Does the county ha uh, have a budget that uh, is in line with the CIDP? CIDP is that county integrated development plan. It's a five-year plan on the development activities that the county is going to have. So is the budget formulated based on that uh, county integrated development plan and the annual plan? Does the county have a monitoring and evaluation committee? So such things are the indicators that we allocate weights and we are able to determine the capacity of a county government based on those indicators. Sorry. So the hypothesis here is the improved systems 
Does the improved system's institutional resource capacity lead to growth in the gross county out uh, product? So the analytical framework that I will use is the Solo Swan model in 1956. And uh, the Solo Swan model, as it is always presented in a nonlinear way, so we shall convert it into logs so as to, to write it in the linear way. So the method I will use is the OLS to analyze this, the ordinary least squares method. And if I encounter any endogeneity problems, then I'll have to go to the uh, two-squared list method. So uh, we shall utilize secondary data from the Ministry of Devolution, the Annual Capacity and Performance Assessment. The current one is 2019-2020. But based on the question I'll ask after this, you will advise me if I, I have to use for the past four years. So I'll, I'll, I also have data for the past four years, survey of the 47 counties in Kenya. And also data from the Kenya Institute of Policy, Public Policy Research and Analysis, KIPRA, from these guys here, from KIPRA. So that is the Kenya Economic Survey Report of 2021. So um, this is where I want your input. So should the research uh, carry out, this, should we carry out this study based on the current survey, that's the, the recent survey of 2021, or should we study and review the trend for the past four years? So maybe we can see the, uh, the, the, the level of capacity in 2017, if they improved and as the growth in uh, gross county product been improving. So I don't know if it will be complicating myself, but I will want you to give me some input on that. So thank you, God bless you. Thank you, Lydia. Okay, we have John. Yeah, thank you, uh, Lydia, for that wonderful presentation. Just a minute, I open my computer. Yeah, thank you, Lydia, for that wonderful presentation. I like the, the idea to look at uh, the county uh, gross product uh, because it is true when you look at uh, the county uh, gross product, there are issues that need to be addressed. Uh, I have some few uh, comments that are going to maybe improve these uh, uh, research. Uh, for example, when you look at uh, uh, the title of the question that, you are, that we are having here, the impact of institutional capacity, systems, and resource capacity, uh, I think what we can do, probably we can be able to to consolidate, because these are three uh, uh, items speaking to gross county product. Uh, maybe we can consolidate the institutional capacity system and resources into one, and maybe we can work with the institutional capacity. Because when you talk about institutional capacity, systems can be plugged in, and also resources can be plugged into that. So I think that will be very, very important. Again, I'm happy to note that uh, uh, you already corrected uh, uh, the issue that was there in terms of uh, measuring gross counter product. And now you're talking about the growth. Yeah, because there could be an issue of how to measure the gross counter product without bringing the issue of either growth or the share of it into this aspect. So I think that is important. Uh, maybe you can look at the issues of uh, 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 the growth the contribution of GCP into GDP, uh, that is very, very important. Uh, I'm also looking at it and I'm seeing, in terms of the variables that we are having, the independent variables, uh, the county, the gross county product uh, usually comes from the contribution of the economic activities of the county. Uh, and it's very, very important because this GCP is the same as the GDP at a national level. And we have the economic activities, the sectors that contribute to this. Uh, probably uh, you can look at how maybe these sectors contribute to the growth of this gross counter product. Because these economic activities or sectors 
receive resources from the county government and then they should be able to give back and contribute into the GCP. So the puzzle here could be, we have these sectors, these economic activities, we give them resources, but what are they bringing back in terms of the growth of a county gross product? This will be very interesting for the policy makers, that is the governor and the ministers of the county, because we'll be telling them, yes, you allocate these resources to these economic sectors, and this is what the economic sectors are giving you back. And the governor will be like, hey, wait a minute. We will not give, we will not allocate more resources to this economic sector because it's not bringing much again in terms of the GCP contribution. Or be like, well, this sector is contributing very well, so more resources. Actually, it is going to inform the county integrated development plans. I mean, all those ADPs and other plans for the county, the local economic development plan of the county is going to be informed uh, using this kind of a study. So it will be very interesting for the policy makers, the county government to see what is coming out from the economic sectors that they are giving resources every financial year. Uh, again, maybe you can also check on the language because uh, when you say that it's performing poorly, there's no benchmark for that poorly. Uh, yeah, because if you tell the governor that uh, your GCP is performing poorly, based on what basis? So probably we can maybe say that uh, Optimal, we need again to get uh, what is optimal. Uh, yeah, we need to be very careful on that. Uh, especially, I know it will be a policy research, like what we do. The language of the government, very, very important to give them the correct uh, information. Uh, that will be very important so that we check on that, the poor, that kind of a language, and then we are able to improve this kind of study. Then we need some statistics to motivate our, 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 our background. So that you can say that uh, this what we expect, what you're saying now the optimal, this what is expected of the county in terms of GCP, and this is what they are doing. So that variation now, we ask ourselves a question, what causes this? This is the estimated, and these are the actual performance in terms of GCP. Then that difference can help us to come up with a puzzle. Uh, then I think uh, uh, the last one is that uh, uh, this is just a general uh, comment that uh, it's also important for you when you working on this study, try to bring out some sectors that are actually doing very well in terms of a GCP contribution. Uh, again, when you do this, these sectors are going to help us even to do across all the sectors, uh, the, count, the counties, and see which sectors are driving economies of the county. Yeah, thank you so much. Then the last one, eh, we noted when you're presenting, uh, you talked about uh, the Kenya new constitution. We no longer call it new constitution. It is Kenya 2010 constitution. It's no longer new, a lot of things have been done to it. We're almost <laughs> revising it again. So it's not a new constitution is Kenya 2010 Constitution. Just a general comment. Uh, thank you so much for that word of presentation. Thank you. All right, Alex and Cecilia have comments. Okay, on my line. Oh, thank you. Thank you for the presentation and, uh, and the discussion for the comment, which uh, also confirmed what I was uh, really thinking about. Uh, for the question that you have asked at the end, I think if, you are, if your topic is about growth in county, gross county product, then I don't understand how you are going to do that analysis using one period data, that is a cross-sectional uh, uh, data, because if you are talking about growth, then it's something that has, there need to be some trend over a period of time. Eh? And I also wonder how you are going to do that with the only four four data points, that is for four years. Eh? So, so, so actually I'm, I'm still not sure how you are going to handle the methodology part, but the, 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 the issue can be seen, the problem can be seen, but uh, the methodology part is what uh, for me is still not clear. I don't know whether you, you are going to use a panel, and if you use a panel then how are you going to, 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 to do the impact analysis? 
then I have I don't have access to I've not had access to that data set that you are going to use, and I was just wondering if uh, the the the, 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 the uh, what what the variables that you are including in your model, if they are at at aggregated level or or at uh, sub sector level sub sector level, I, I'm not just sure of how that because that will also inform how you how you are going to, the, the methodology that you are going to use, eh? the nature of that uh, data set. Is it at sector level or is it at uh, uh, county, sub-county level or whatever? And, and I don't know, for, for the, the kind of impact you are going to do, the most appropriate model will have been uh, a CGE model, but uh, now I don't know whether National Treasury has a, such a model for for the counties, I, I know, I know we have the Kipra macro model uh, for the for the uh, for the national uh, government, uh, where we always do our macroeconomic uh, forecast. But for the counties, I don't know how you can uh, use this because the most appropriate uh, model there will be to use a CGE model to 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 just see how the variability in uh, in county in gross county product when you trickle some of those variables of interest. Uh, then, then, uh, then another thing is was about uh, the measurement of the county, uh, gross county product. Uh, there has been a debate on which one is the best approach uh, because as we know from economic theory, whatever approach you use to measure GDP, it should give you the same, the same result. But for this gross county product, there has been a, an issue because if you use expenditure approach, you get a different figure from when you use the value-added approach. Eh? So there has been a very great debate on which is the correct uh, gross uh, uh, county product for, for these counties. For example, a county like Kajiado that is just next to Nairobi, when you use uh, expenditure approach, it is among the top three or top five uh, best performing counties. Simply because most people working, who are working in Nairobi are living in Kajiado. So they they, co they consume, the most consumption is, is in the county. But when it comes to now productivity, they don't have much. They, they are, it's a, a largely a, a pastoralist community, partly a pastoralist community, and much of their production is, let's say, on, in agriculture, which is not much. So when you now look at the value-added approach, they are, not, they are among the, the worst performing counties. So there is that puzzle that I I don't know which I don't know which uh, which approach is now the best approach to capture the the productivity of 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 each and every county. So you also need to look into that because it can be a, something that will be raised after you've done your analysis. Then you are told basically what you are using as your main variable is something that cannot be relied upon. Yeah. Thank you. Great, Cecilia. Okay. Thank you. Maybe I'll, I'll come to Lydia's rescue a bit. I think, because I, I know the data she's using. She's using the county gross product from KNBS from 2013 to 2020. So I think KNBS already sorted out the issue of how they are calculating the GCP. So I don't think she's calculating it herself. So I think for, I don't know, maybe, maybe not. Lydia, maybe. Uh, online has a comment. Yeah, good morning, colleagues. Yeah. Good morning. My, 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 co my comment was to, yes, I'm Musambia Mtambala from Tanzania. My comment was to really support the previous, um, the, the previous comment that uh, that also suggested on think about uh, the trend. So when the discussant raised the issue of uh, statistics, I also got in mind that we should have an analysis that is based on the four years um, data. I think that one could be could explain could explain well the the issue that the, 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 the research wanted to wanted to improve. So 
he has well said about it. I don't have much to, to add on that because I also think about uh, having a trend require the scholar to have enough data. If the data is, is available, I think it's better that we go for the trend to have the, the past four years data and then have uh, much to, to tell. So should have much to say about it and then that will be really enriching your, your paper. Thank you very much. I think we should move on because we have 20 minutes left and, and we have Professor Robinson's comments that we all look forward to. So, and Moses, please. <coughs> Thank you. Good morning. Um, I'm Moses, as you've been told, and um, I'm start. Uh, okay, I have two presentations. I hope, as I was asked by Professor Batista, that I'll be able to manage it within that short time. Yes, I'll consolidate the time. So I, I think uh, just to mention that I have uh, interest in the area of financial innovations, which I did for my PhD, and uh, right uh, and financial inclusion. Uh, where I am also doing a study on financial inclusion and resilience to COVID-19 economic shocks, uh, currently supported by ARC at the uh, uh, thematic area finance and resource mobilization. So in the course of doing these studies, we come across these other studies that talk about um, um, issues to do with financial exclusion. I hope I'm very good in managing this one. Okay, so um, as you've seen, is the question we are asking is uh, what uh, what drives financial inclusion or rather exclusion? Uh, uh, now I've got to the end. Okay, sorry. So that is what uh, drives financial exclusion in East Africa, and uh, this is an empirical evidence from Kenya. The issues that arise here is that there is a lot of focus on financial inclusion, um, uh, which is also defined in the context of financial exclusion. And um, uh, okay, so. Uh, the research question we ask is, who is financially excluded in Kenya? I hope that is a well-stated <laughs> research question, but let's go on. The second question is, why are they financially excluded? Uh, according to St. Clair 2001, financial exclusion should be seen as the inability to assess required financial services in an appropriate form, and hence financial exclusion is a function of uh, problems with assets. Uh, the study on financial inclusion has over the years been done in the context of broader societal issues of social ex uh, exclusion or inclusion. Thus, uh, uh, Lation and Drift have defined uh, financial exclusion as a process that work to hinder certain indi individuals and social groups from assessing a uh, formal financial system. In the last two decades, we find uh, the economy has borne, uh, gl the global economy has borne the brunt of uh, uh, various economic shocks ranging from the global financial crisis of 2008, COVID-19 pandemic, and now the Russia invasion of Ukraine. Financial crises have a wide uh, social and economic implications for reasons that they stimulate what they refer to as the flight to uh, f to quality, a practice in financial markets where financial institutions uh, lending practices discriminate against the poor uh, in favor of the affluent in society. So uh, we're looking at these uh, forms of financial exclu as exclusion as identified in the literature, in the 
I don't know how to pronounce this, I think Russian name here, uh, 2007, uh, there are five forms of financial exclusion that have been identified here. First one being that of assets exclusion, and this is the restriction of assets through the process of risk management, which I think I've just mentioned. Uh, second is the condition exclusion, where the conditions attached to financial products make them inappropriate for the needs of certain uh, of some people. For instance, if there is uh, insistence on the payment of interest rates and you are Muslim, then you may exclude yourself for reasons that uh, Muslims don't believe in uh, paying uh, interest or charging interest. Price exclusion, where some people can only gain access to financial products at prices they cannot afford. Marketing exclusion, whereby some people are effectively excluded by targeting uh, marketing and sales. So you conduct marketing and sales activities that don't reach the people that uh, who need that product. And lastly, we have self-exclusion, where people may decide that um, there is little point uh, applying for a financial product because they believe they would uh, be refused. Sometimes this is as a result of having been refused uh, personally um, in, in the past, sometimes because they know someone else who has been refused or because of a belief that they don't accept people who live around here. So all these with good to somebody's mind, they feel, I, I really don't need to apply for that loan. In any case, I will be denied. Um, so according to Financial Services Authority, uh, the five forms of financial exclusion form a complex set of barriers to the use and access of formal financial services by a large segment of the population in developing countries. So we go to the measurement of variables. Unfortunately, I haven't indicated all the variables here, um, but the, most the key variable there uh, is access to formal uh, bank account, which is an indicator of financial exclusion if one, so that if the respondent has no bank account, um, then it is, is zero, uh, otherwise, I mean, otherwise it's one. Does the respondent use a bank account, uh, and so on. Um, financial inclusion, so we use, um, uh, it's captured in two ways. We use a simple measure that asks whether respondents, uh, whether the respondent has a bank account or not. Those without bank accounts are defined as being financially excluded, of course, in view of the literature. The second measure uh, is a measure of financial, I mean, the second measure of financial inclusion is a previous use of financial services, such as uh, savings through the form of financial institution. Overall, all the indicators are measured as a dichotomous variable taking a form, I mean, one and zero and one, I mean, zero and, between zero and, I mean, zero or one, as just discussed. And data sources, uh, we expect to collect data from 47 counties, but I think we do a sampling of maybe number of counties using an appropriate sampling uh, criteria. And the model specification is there, the analytical model is provided there. Um, so we're studying f uh, if we study 47 counties, then um, uh, we see how it goes. Financial exclusion is measured by a lack of access or lack of usage to a bank account. I think I had explained that one earlier on. And the, the variables I explained earlier on, independent variables, um, financial exclusion uh, drivers of financial, I mean, uh, financial exclusion drivers for individual I in account J, where X1 is assets. I think I've explained those conditions earlier on. Um, there is a condition, uh, exclusion, price exclusion, marketing exclusion, and um, the fifth one there. I think marketing or something. Uh, control variables, so we have not yet really fully identified. Uh, coefficients to be estimated are given there. So thus the model will examine whether financial exclusion is driven, uh, driven by the five drivers identified in the literature, or maybe if we identify other drivers in the course of the study, we will also see the implication of that. Um, so I think that's for study one. Thank you, Moses. So Dennis is in charge of discussing. So do I present the ah, other one? Ah, right, you have oh. a second <laughs> one. Okay. So go, go. Okay. Go so, fast. So this second study is on African financial markets fragmentation. The second study is on uh, is asking a question. Uh, no, there's the same study. There's one on uh, African financial markets fragmentation.
Yes, so uh, the, the second study is uh, African financial markets fragmentation. Is financial innovation the missing li uh, link? Uh, do you want to provide evidence from Kenya? Um, the research, key research questions we ask in this study is why do borrowers prefer borrowing from informal markets, informal financial markets? To why do borrowers prefer borrowing from formal financial markets? Three, why do borrowers prefer borrowing from both formal and informal financial markets? And that lastly, are there linkages between the formal and informal financial uh, markets in Kenya? Most African financial markets are highly fragmented, as is evident in the literature. They're highly fragment fragmented, creating what we call dualistic markets, where there is no link between the formal and informal financial markets. Actually, what we mean here is that uh, we tend to have uh, parallel financial markets, the informal financial markets and formal financial markets. Those you borrow from informal financial markets are unable to assess um, and are unable to borrow from uh, formal financial markets for reasons that they cannot, they do not have security, uh, and they have other limitations that we mentioned earlier on to do with exclusion. Um, so a number of economists and finance practitioners contend that fragmentation in financial markets is not desirable. Uh, consequently, in, res in response, numerous efforts have been made at intro uh, introducing financial sector reforms such as liberalization of interest rates, credit controls, and elimination of credit ceilings. And all this is uh, um, uh, meant to bring the two markets together or to simply link them. On the other hand, there is a compelling evidence that informal financial markets continue to expand in most sub-Saharan African economies in spite of financial reforms aimed at curtailing their growth. The argument here is that uh, we don't want a very huge uh, informal uh, financial markets for reasons that, um, the one, there is no data no way of tracking, for instance, informal lenders, and therefore that, uh, since there is no data, it has implications on monetary policy decisions, and a wide, really quite a wide discussion around that issue. So the, 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 the issue, the idea has been to make sure that the, the market, the formal market is big or grows at the expense of the informal, uh, informal financial markets. Um, so, uh, RT uh, argues that uh, African socioeconomic orientation will continue to fuel the growth of informal markets. The other opines that instead of working to eliminate the informal markets, uh, effective linkages should be established to enhance the efficiency of financial system. So this, um, uh, this paper argues that really we should not work to eliminate uh, one market um, and uh, let the other one grow. What we should really look for is the point of intersection between the two markets. And that is what the focus of this work is, uh, to ask ourselves whether now innovations that have uh, come would be, uh, I mean, would help to bring these uh, linkages. So this study seeks to provide evidence that the recent financial innovations in branchless banking uh, is a missing link between formal and informal markets. The study draws lessons from Kenya where these innovations have been uh, practically applied. So the uh, research problem here, as uh, Sabel and Marx argue that fragmentation in African financial markets means that the two markets largely move past one another. The implication of this fragmentation is that those who borrow from formal financial markets don't borrow in formal markets. Commercial banks have no incentive to lend uh, to high-risk borrowers who have no loan collateral, uh, flight risk, and, uh, and the transaction cost of lending to risky borrowers is significantly high. For instance, for a commercial bank to lend $50, it would incur uh, cost higher than the amount loaned, especially when one factor one factors in the cost of following up on the borrower. The advent of mobile money appears to create a new avenues to link the two markets, but there is no uh, sufficient empirical evidence. This paper seeks to address this research gap. Now, the independent variables here. Okay, uh, I'm actually done. Uh, almost done. Access to. Uh, so, the independent variable is, is the key word there is access. So, access to mobile loans, access to bank loans, variable two. Uh, in um, uh, access to informal loans, uh, 
three dependent variable three dependent variables is a linkage between formal and informal financial markets represented by individuals borrowing from both formal and informal markets so that is a point of intersection between the two the analytical model again is specified there which i think you can follow uh the uh the data sources is the same as the earlier one and i think uh i'm done in africa when you say one minute it has a way of <laughs> thank you okay dennis uh well uh thanks dr moses uh I had to go very speedy, uh, same as you are presenting, so as to come up with uh, some comments. Um, I find it interesting with your topics. Uh, you have very good topics, uh, since uh, most of us, and uh, we normally talk of financial inclusion, that's what we normally uh, research on, but now you are coming different with the financial exclusion. So that is very interesting. Starting with uh, our first topic, uh, I have identified some of the points that you need to take into consideration. Uh, I have gone through the fin, fin access uh, of 2019 um, this was actually uh, by South Africa, and they are talking about financial inclusion uh, being risen to 82.9 percent from 26.7 in 2006, and the complete ex ex exclusion has narrowed uh, to 11 point from 41.3 percentages in 2006. So at least the, these are the statistics that. You should also think about, I mean, going through some papers and uh, getting to know. I mean, having the uh, good under understanding of the statistics in terms of uh, financial exclusion. Yeah, so I find it very important to provide the statistics for the exclusion journey, uh, comparing uh, to the past and the present. But uh, I also believe that in Kenya, at least, uh, as compared to other countries, uh, not only in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, but in Africa in general, that we have done a lot in the uh, uh, financial inclusion. So I, I, I was thinking it is also better if you do the benchmarking, I mean getting to have a clear understanding of uh, uh, the best uh, case and worst case scenarios, because I came to realize uh, in terms of uh, being financially excluded, uh, the leading countries in Africa is South Africa, Botswana, and Kenya. So at least you are doing better as compared to, to other countries in Africa. So it's good also to understand that. But uh, I have also, I, I think it is also uh, better if you go through the Kenya Vision 2030. Uh, what does it tell about uh, the financial exclusion and what are the initiatives uh, available in the ground? Yes, so that is, but also uh, I'm not so much sure with this. Uh, I'm thinking also to have the statistics in terms of gender for the financial exclusion uh, just by sharing, uh, showing the gender disparities. Well, for the fragmentation, market fragmentation, uh, I have seen that you uh, you cited, uh, you have a reference of uh, 1987. So I think it to be, uh, uh, a lot has been done. Uh, you know, that maybe you can just look around and uh, have, have a recent uh, data and then that will help you to have a clear understanding of what is actually happening. Uh, yes, uh, you have talked of uh, the comparing, uh, comparing evidence on continuity of informal financial markets. Um, but I was wondering, uh, getting to understand how, where, and, 
and also providing some, some evidences as in terms of, uh, of stats. You have also discussed about uh, formal financial markets expanding, but also you talked of uh, uh, you, uh, there is evidence of formal financial markets expanding, but you also talked of uh, uh, having evidence on continuing of informal financial markets. So I find it mixing. You are being positive and then at the same time you are being uh, negative. Uh, like, you know, expansion between formal and informal appearing to be parallel. So how and uh, in, in, in what aspect? Yes, but also uh, I will talk of uh, b benchmarking. Uh, is there a missing link between formal and informal markets? Uh, because I know even the, uh, these informal, informal uh, markets, uh, now there are some of the initiatives uh, in the ground uh, to, to make them formal. So you can also uh, have a look on uh, what is actually trying to be done so as to formalize these informal, informal markets because I understand even those who are going to the to, to the vibandas for the uh, I mean having these uh, services uh, they are they are also now uh, recognized uh, li like in my country now we are trying hard to register this what was not before registered so as to formalize uh, their, their services uh, the microfinance institutions uh, that we are operating informally now it is a very serious matter that they need to be registered and yeah so thank you that that is what i with the uh, model specifications in terms of uh, methodology i have nothing to 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 say about it uh, and i'm not uh, interested at all to, to to understand with the econometrics maybe that is another class for me thank you okay I, um, do we have time for comments or do you want to discuss them? I think we're very short of time, yeah. sorry. But why don't you write them down and send them to Moses? Is, would that work? Or save them and on Monday we can start the briefly with them. Sorry. But Allow me to just mention something. Oh yes, of course. That's the response uh, with Monday. regard especially to one item that he mentioned about uh, the informal markets expanding, formal markets expanding, and whether there is a, the issue is, yes, there is evidence that uh, informal financial markets are growing. The formal financial markets are also growing. Uh, but, but the issue here, the key argument here uh, is that um, the, 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 there should not be informal markets. A lot of, uh, uh, in fact, you also alluded to the same, that there is a lot of effort to formalize these markets. So the argument by Eritrea is that we should not seek to eliminate one. What we should seek is a linkage between the markets. Thank you. But the arguments will be considered. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. So, sorry we have to run. Um, so let me say a few things. They're all really interesting. Um, so start just in chronological order. Uh, Ruth, I mean, I, you know, so I think what's, I've done a lot of work on uh, the impact of uh, political regimes on economic growth and public good provision. So, so we published a paper a couple of years ago looking at the impact of democratizations on economic growth and also public good provision uh, and we found very robust positive effects. You could say quantitatively not massive, you know, the long run impact of democratizing on GDP per capita is about 40% increase. But, but I don't know if people have looked at the consequences of democratization for fiscal sustainability or the deficit relative to GDP or, you know, the kind of deficit, you know, the debt accumulation. So. So, and you know, there's been like quite a bit of discussion this morning about political business cycles, you know, but, but, but 
non-democracies in Africa also accumulated quite a lot of debt. You know, non-democracies in Latin America certainly accumulated large amounts of debt. So I think it's kind of interesting to think through here, you know, like what are the consequences? I mean, when I was hearing you talk, you know, of course you have, there's almost like, you know, you have a kind of, uh, you know, there's different agendas here, like, the, you know, is fiscal policy sustainable in Kenya? That seems to me to be a very hard question to answer because you have to make forecasts about productivity and economic growth and state capacity and the ability to raise taxes and all, you know, so that's, I think that's an interesting question. It seems hard to kind of answer, but I was just thinking when you were talking, like, what would I take out of this in terms of, like, the social science? And it seems to be, we can talk more about this next week, but this question of, you know, what's the impact of political regimes on debt, all these different types of debt and fiscal sustainability issues, debt ratios, and it's not clear that democracy is like worse at managing this than dictatorships, but also, of course, it's true that, you know, non-democratic regimes have elections too. Typic it's very unusual not to have elections, you know. Everyone has elections, you know. Uh, even one-party states have elections. And so one party states face lots of political pressures also. So like trying to unpack that and sort of look at that more systematically in the data, I think would be really interesting. I had also had, I'm not gonna tell you now, but I had a very good idea after you were talking. So <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll write to you about it. Yeah, I think there's something very interesting about this issue of, you know, like is it, it, there's a, in terms of the deficit, the effect of increasing expenditures or cutting taxes looks the same, but actually they're kind of profoundly different in terms of fiscal consolidation. Yeah, so I had an idea. I think I had a good idea about that. So, but I'll write to you, yeah. So I, we can talk more about that, but I would say like there's a set of issues there that I don't think people have explored at all, not, not, in my, not to my knowledge. And there's a, there's a data set in political science actually, which has coded, you know, the extent to which non-democratic regimes actually have elections and whether these debt or sustainability dynamics have changed in Africa with the transition to democracy. I think that's, it may not be a literature I know very well, but I don't think anyone has looked at that. So we can talk more. I think Lydia, you know, I think this data sounds like super interesting, but it isn't like the thousand and one dollar question here. It seems to me that what was the consequence of this constitutional reform? You know, so, so the constitutional reform sort of decentralizes all these things. There's all this variation in state capacity at the county level. I guess so what, some of what you're describing now in this data collection is, you know, the consequence of institutional dynamics since 2010. So these county governments are building institutions and they're building capacity. But I guess there's also, you know, thinking back to Putnam, there's a lot of deeply historical variations. So if I were working on this topic, which, you know, which I'm not, so, you know, so, so maybe you can just ignore this. You know, it's something I've worked on a lot in other parts of the world, like in Colombia, for example. I've, all, I've been fascinated for years at the, w the enormous variation in state capacity within Colombia. And it's super interesting, it's like very historically rooted. You know, a lot of it goes back to the colonial period. Why not in Kenya? I don't know anything about Kenya, but I guess a lot of the history, the institutions are rooted in, in the colonial period, in, you know, in like look at South Africa, you know, think about that's something I know more about. If you think about state capacity, you compare the homelands or the former Bantu stands, but you kind of had that here. You know, you had this exploitation of African labor by white agricultural interests. And like, so I would just, you know, it's just like for me, just starting to think through this variation in state capacity within Kenya, trying to think through the historical sources of variation of that, so, like absolutely fascinating. And like, so, so you know, you, 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 yesterday you were talking about this at the end, like just a puzzle, starting with a puzzle about state capacity, you know, and, 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 and where that variation comes from. I think, yeah, I think the four years of data, you could run a panel data regression, but that's not really the thousand and one dollar question here, it seems to me. And just delving into this, you know, any African country that I've ever been in has a huge amount of variation in state capacity. You know, even little places like Sierra Leone, you know, like, uh, the, the, you know, the it's, of course it's, off the chart in somewhere like Nigeria or Congo or whatever, but, but that is almost an unresearched topic in my 
to my, there's some work in political science, like um, who's the lady at the LSE? Catherine Boone, and but but there's very little work on that to my knowledge. Sorry, you were going to say something. No, that I think that. So I know you're all economists, and I'm the political scientist. <laughs> <laughs> but writing a new constitution is about politics. Making new deals within society is about politics. Uh, deciding how to decentralize and why to decentralize is about politics. And you completely ignore that. So I think that's something to be taken into account because I guess the dynamics within the politics of making those agreements have some consequences over the variables that you want to argue that have explanatory power on your, f on your dependent variable. So the variation, I which is exactly what Professor Robinson is saying, the variation that you observe in the capacity of all of these different counties might be ref a reflection of the way the different um, groups wi uh, within Kenya have decided on how to organize and respond to that new social pact that was written in 2010 and has been kept on changing. But, it, but if James says he doesn't know anything about Kenya, I don't know anything about Kenya. But you have to yeah. think about those political dynamics as well. Yeah. So, so I, you know, we could talk more. So the topic is fantastic, I think. And Moses, you know, so I have like, so I guess my comment on the first paper was, you know, you know what my comment is, too many variables. I, I also thought when you were talking about exclusion, I thought, like, I think, you know, as economists, we have to think about what's efficient, you know, like, I, I, I mean, I'm also a political scientist, and I realize the definition, but the difference between economics and political science is that in economists have this notion of efficient. There's this idea of a kind of normative benchmark. In political science, there's just stuff, you know, like there's stuff, <laughs> and, 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 and but, but so there's no concept of efficiency in political science. But so can't we think about exclusion like that? You know, I was thinking when you were talking that I'm, ex you know, I have a bank account, but I'm excluded from the Rolls Royce market, you know, because the price is too high. Is that efficient? Is that inefficient? Like typically we'd say, no, you know, it's not, it's, not, it's not efficient. It's not Pareto inefficient that I don't buy a Rolls Royce because I'm too poor. So, 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 you could so, so I think like more discussion of the kind of welfare economics or the public finance of that would be, would be really good. And just I think like, you know, I think you know, the exercise is super interesting, but I guess like to make it into an academic paper, you know, it needs to be more of a puzzle, like there's, you need more of a hook, you know, uh, like to, 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 why is some people are financially excluded? You know, they're too poor. Okay, fine. That's the problem, but it's not terribly surprising. Where's the, you know, like if you were, if you presented that in a conference, you know, at Chicago, they'd say it's a fishing expedition. You know, you throw a net out, you run a regression with like lots of variables and you pull the net in and you may well learn something kind of important, I think, you know, socially important for policy perspectives, but I guess you get my point, you know. The second project I found like extremely exciting, actually. So this idea, so I'm gonna make a conjecture. So this idea that, so there's some sort of, I never thought about this before, but the idea that synergy between the informal sector, like in, in terms of occupation and informal financial markets I've never heard that idea before. I, maybe I don't know the literature well, but that seems really interesting. And what's the impact of technology on that? Yeah, you, you, you know, you, Mpesa, okay, fine. That, that's, that's, that's not informal, that's formal, okay? I understand informal is borrowing from the shopkeeper or, but, you know, but technological change, it seems to me, facilitates informal finance as well as formal finance. The fact that everyone has telephones, doesn't that also in facilitate informality? So I think like what was, what's really, so two things here are really interesting. One is this kind of synergy between informal, is there a synergy between, um, I guess the question, between informal occupation, informal occupation makes it much more difficult to access formal financial institutions. So then that pushes you into informal financial markets and then informal fi the financial markets are expensive and that kind of locks, it's just like a vicious circle. It's like a kind of development trap, you know. Uh, that's interesting and also just this technological change, you know. Is it true that 
the dissemination of smartphones or whatever it is, or technological change, could actually encourage, yeah, it seems to encourage formal, but maybe it also encourages informal. I, I don't know how one could kind of investigate that, but I think like the idea that this, you know, I'm very skeptical about the idea that technological is a technology is a solution for every development you know, problem. Like the people at the World Bank, they just think every, every problem is, has some technological solution, which I don't believe at all. You know, technology just depends on what human beings do with it, it seems to me. But I think like if one could think through that, I think it's a, it's a really interesting idea. So I, d I, d I, I guess I like the second project more than the first project. The first project may be very important from a sort of policy point of view, but the second project seemed to me there were all sorts of really interesting directions to go in. Anyway, and we have to go and have lunch. Sorry, we're, I feel very antisocial, but <laughs> we're going to the Maasai Mara to do something very serious and intellectual. We're going to study, you know, lions and they're very interesting, you know, like whether they're patriarchal, male dominated, female dominated. Okay, great, thank you. They were all uh, fantastic, very good, yes. Very good, very, very, everything is super interesting. Yeah, and no one's talking about monetary policy, thank you. <laughs>